seated. Just keep singing. Because that's the next song he keeps me singing. Oh. 
sacred head for sinners such as I. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide, and shut his glories in, when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature sin at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day thus might i hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt mine eyes to tears at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love i owe here lord i give myself away tis all that i can do at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day thank you that's it uh let's go to the lord in prayer lord god we thank you lord once again lord for your blessings of life lord we just thank you god for Another opportunity, Lord, to be in your house tonight, Lord. God, we just thank you for our services that we had this morning, Lord. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. God, we pray for the ones that's on our prayer list, Lord, the sick, the ones that's in hospitals, Lord, the, the ones that's grown cold and indifferent, Lord. We just pray for them, Lord. God, for those that are traveling tonight, Lord, we just pray travel mercies for them, Lord. And God, as we come to this portion of the service, Lord, we just Pray for the speaker of the hour, Lord. Just pray, God, you give him the words that we stand in need of, Lord, that we can apply it to our life to be a better people for you. And, God, I pray that you forgive me where I fail you so many times in life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Ray. We're going to be uh, looking at Micah, chapter 6, very familiar text. I am not a pastor any longer. I'm retired. And um, I served as a pastor of several churches, one here in uh, Waycross at First Baptist Church for, oh, a dozen years or so. And... Uh, that was back in the 90s. I uh, worked for the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. as a, we're actually worked for the Georgia Baptist Foundation for the last 18 years of my ministry. 
and retired to a blueberry farm out in Hoboken, Georgia. There wasn't a blueberry farm when I got it, and it isn't much of one now, but that's where I live. I have two children. One is a nurse in uh, Satella Regional. She's been there for over 20 years. Uh, used to work in radiology. I think she's in day surgery now. And my son works for the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. He is a preacher, served several churches here in Georgia, and then has gone to work as a discipleship consultant. For some reason or another, both children, one now 53, the other one 51, decided they wanted to live on the farm. So they both live within 100 yards of me down on the farm, and uh, we get along very well. Not too bad for living that close together. I have four grandsons, three of them are married. Two of them got married during COVID last year. One got married just a few weeks ago, and I've got another one that's, uh, I think he's not planning on getting married or anything else for that matter. And that's who I am. But I am a person a lot like you. I am a fellow pilgrim on this Christian road. And sometimes uh, I get a chance to think about it. At one time, I, I had to think about it all the time. It was my job to think about it. But now I just think about it because, I don't know, it's something I enjoy. So I'm going to ask you tonight, um, if you could, could you tell me or could you tell your neighbor exactly why you go to church? Have you ever thought about, you know why you go to church, but have you thought about how you could tell somebody why you go to church? Well, I'm going to tell you something. I have gotten older, and I have found that simpler is always better. Amen? Steak only needs pepper and salt. I don't know about that other stuff. Tastes good, but all you need is the basics. I learned a theory a long time ago when I was working in another before I went in the ministry and they taught us a, the KISS theory. You know about the KISS theory? K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, silly. <laughs> My oldest grandson, Ryan, when he was in the first grade, he spent a lot of time with us in Waycross and... Uh, one night he said, uh, or we were sitting at the table, and I was expounding about something, and I said, well, that was just stupid. And he went, oh, oh. Mammy, Papa said the S word. I said, what? I did not. Yes, you did. You said the S word. What did I say? He said, you said stupid. You don't say that word. He learned that. That's the, that was way back in the beginning of our new politically correct language uh, stuff, which has gotten, by the way, insane. So for Ryan's sake, we will just keep it simple, silly. Let's look at Micah. This is a text that you know well. But since I want to keep it simple... And I want to tell you as a, not as a minister, but as a fellow pilgrim, why I go to church. Chapter 6 in Micah, verse 6 says, what, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now we dealt with the last one this morning, walking humbly with God the way Jesus intended uh, for us to. But I want to deal with some other things tonight. So first, they tell me in preaching school years ago that if you'll tell people what you're going to say and then say it and then sit down, they'll be a whole lot happier. So here's what I'm going to try to tell you. It's my intention to persuade you that church attendance is not only necessary, but it is an absolute joy. Especially at churches like these where people are so loving and so kind. I have many wants and many needs. My wife will tell you so. But my greatest need, I would say our greatest need, is to know God. Our faith teaches that God created us in his image. Now, thoughts and questions about God has populated my conscious mind for as long as I can remember. So I decided that God does exist. So if that is my decision, and it is, now, that's, not a, that's a decision that all of us would take for granted, right? But that, that decision is not taken for granted the worldwide or even, or even Pierce County-wide. Ninety-five percent of Americans will tell you they believe in God, but only about 35 percent of them ever attend a church. So if I have decided that God does exist, we're going to keep it simple. Who is God? What is he up to? And what does he want from me? Okay? That simple. As you know, life is short. You only get one try. And I would like for it to mean something. I would like to be victorious in it and about it. And I would like to enjoy it. I would like to live forever in order to continue to enjoy the relationships that I have built here on earth. And even expand them once I enter the heavenly realm. And to one day meet my Savior face to face. I believe that my best shot at achieving those goals is by being part of a local church and attending faithfully the opportunities it affords to worship, to learn, and to serve alongside of like-minded, loving Christians. The church experience with its varied relationships enriches my understanding of God. It also enriches my understanding of myself, things that I realize about myself I could not have realized in isolation. We need to be in community, and we need to be in community with like-minded people who have similar goals. So the first question I said is, who is God? I think that each one of you could, uh, could tell me that, but I'm going to tell you how I think about it. On April the 8th of 1966, just before my high school graduation, tells you a little bit about how young I am, I saw a Time Magazine cover that had printed on it, Is God Dead? Y'all remember that? 
Inside was a story of how modern theologians were increasingly writing God out of the equation of reality. The world was shocked. It was shocked to learn what was going on behind academia's doors. That was back in the 60s. Today, an education is not complete unless the notion of God has been completely undermined, completely undermined at least, and at worst, mocked. But I believe in Holy Scripture, along with 5,000 years of recorded history, affirms that God does actually exist. Before there was a molecule or an atom or a quark, there was only God. That's what the Bible teaches, and I don't know anything in science that can dispute that. Before there was an element or a mineral, light or darkness or anything for my mind to perceive, there was God. This is what the Bible says. Now, the word truth has been ascribed to the person of God in theological circles for centuries and centuries. So we use the word truth in many ways in our language. We think of the truth as just the facts, ma'am. The truth is not a lie. The truth is what I'm trying to tell you about the real nature of things. But for religious folks, for theologians, dating all the way back to before the Roman Empire, truth with a capital T is the word used for the irreducible reality we know as God. Irreducible. That is the most fundamental reality there is. According to Aristotle's secular description, he is the unmoved mover. The first cause of all existence and reality. Plato considered him the ideal form, the truth from which all reality emanates. Therefore, God was the embodiment to the early philosophers of all that is good. Philosophy is, of course, man's attempt with his mind to get to the bottom of things. What is fundamental? What is essential? Learned people in the first century when Jesus was walking the earth were familiar with this quest for truth. Men like Pilate. He's been placed in a politically compromised position. He asked Jesus, what is truth? But Jesus remained perfectly silent because he was the truth with a capital T. And Pilate couldn't recognize the truth even when the truth was standing right in front of him. All that the classical philosophers and sophists had tried to imagine was standing right in front of Pilate in all his glory and he doesn't get it. So that is our Fundamental problem, because you see, God, for all of our attempts to know him, the Bible says he is unknowable. Oh my goodness. If what I just said is true, we have a real problem, do we not? The Bible says it. Isaiah says his understanding no one can fathom. Because of God's divine nature and because of our sinful nature, we cannot really know him except for one reason. And that's number two. Who is God? He's the creator. 
What is he up to? All right, this is Bible 101. Everything God has done in the past and is going to do in the present and will do in the future is to overcome that difficulty we have in knowing him by revealing who he is to us, his children. It's called revelation. Not the book, but the act of revealing a hidden nature. To make himself known to his creation in such a way that they respond to him in love and worship and fellowship and obedience. That's it. That's Old Testament 101. If you read it from cover to cover, you see God acting in history to reveal himself to a people that he has chosen so that they can be his facilitator in revealing him to the nations. In order for you to know God, he has to be revealed. Romans chapter 1 says, this is Paul, he says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. All right, so one of the ways we know God is that he's revealed himself in creation. We look at the design and the beauty and the color and the intricacy and we can see that there's a pattern there and that it is a pattern from a mind that is beyond ours. So yes, we can look at nature and we can tell that there's a God. Paul goes on to say, for although they knew God from his revelation in nature, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Hold on to that word darkened. Okay? That has a special meaning. So everyone can know God. We can observe the power and divinity of God by simply looking about us at the order of the universe. The grand design of the whole thing. So... You don't need the church to know God. Oh, uh, it, it, I get your attention? You don't need the church to know God. You can observe him out there. Now, I'm an outdoor enthusiast, and fellow outdoor enthusiasts are right. You can worship God from a boat or a tree stand or in a beautiful garden. You can do that. But it doesn't accomplish God's will. And that kind of revelation will not save you. It will not lead you to where God is leading. We are created with the ability to acknowledge God, but from nature we conclude nothing. And soon we start worshiping the boat or the tree or the rock. Now, here's where the Bible and church comes into play. We, we getting there? God's next step was to choose a man, bless him, and promise him that if he will keep the covenant between them, God will make of him a great nation. That was Abraham. So he chooses Abraham, and he blesses him, and he makes of him a great nation, that they would be a light to the nation. So God begins a long historical interaction with a tribe of people in order to reveal himself to the rest of the world. Their job is to live in such a marked, different way that others will be drawn into a relationship with their true creator. They will literally be a light to the nations. That was their job. And who are the nations? Let me tell you who the nations are. That's the people we mentioned before who know God from his creation, but then they enter into darkness because they can go no further. They begin to worship the creation instead of the creator. Darkness 
is the inability to recognize God or to mistake creation or nature as God. Isaiah 9, 2 said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light when Jesus came upon the earth. So the entire Old Testament from Abraham onward is the written historical record of God's interaction with his people, his saving acts, his patient and steadfast love, and his law, the Ten Commandments, all geared to make them a witness to the darkness in mankind's soul. This is where the Bible comes into play. It is the only reliable record of what God is up to in the world. If you don't believe me, you just pay attention to some of these nutcases on the radio and other places who say they know what God is up to. And you listen to them and say, good gracious, where did that come from? Mars? Outer space? We need a reliable record if we're to know who God truly is, and that is the Bible. We learn in the Bible that God is trying to redeem his sinful creation and bring them under his rule through love and not force. But all is not perfect. God's people either act like they don't know him or they get so jealous of their neighbors that they borrow their gods and re-enter the darkness, so to speak. Living by the law is as cold and impersonal as the stone tablets they were written on. So God moves from a general revelation to one that is more specific. Now God gets down to business. He comes to earth and he takes up residence in the flesh in the form of his one and his only son. Hebrews says, by the way, Jesus is God's final an ultimate and complete act of revealing himself. He comes to earth, he takes up residence in the flesh. Hebrews says, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways in order to reveal himself. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now that's revelation right there. Jesus is the final word about who God is and what he's up to. God may be way more than that, but there ain't nothing more we need to know. That's a lifetime's worth of knowledge right there. And when we get to heaven, maybe we'll find out some more stuff. But we don't need to know that part. All we need to know is that Jesus is the exact representation of God. And if you want to know who God is, you've got to acknowledge that Jesus is his son and his final revelation. The people of God, the church, are the only ones on earth who take the revelation seriously. And they're able to continue with this help and power to complete what God has started and sustains. That's why I need the church. Now that I know what he's up to, revealing himself to the nations, I can discover what he wants from me. What is it? See, this is where the rubber hits the road for us as individuals. We know all this other stuff is theological and truth, but what about me? Where do I fit in God's plan? What's God's will for my life? You've heard people say that. I've had people come in my office and say, what's God's will for my life? And go, what do you think it is? And you get a bunch of stuff, you know, and people are really trying to search and trying to find out. But remember, we're trying to keep it simple. Silly. So what does he want from me? He wants for me to have an abundant life. That's what Jesus told us. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Now, what does that mean? I like the idea of abundant life, don't you? That's a good thing. It means here's what 
He wants me to have the same quality of life that he had while he was on this earth. That is the abundant life. Abundance of life is the fullest knowledge of God leading to complete obedience of God. It is a pilgrimage and an odyssey, and it ends in perfection only as we enter heaven's gate. So, yep, we're all short. <clears throat> Paul said we all fall short. Yeah, we're all short, but we're on the road. And I told you this morning, there ain't no getting off of that road once you're on it. You're his child. He's not going to abandon you. Now, the next thing he wants, first he first. He wants me to have abundant life, and that's not the abundant life of the television evangelists. That's not a BMW or a Rolex watch or a big fancy house or any of that kind. That's not, that, that's not abundant life. In fact, for those of you who have had that kind of stuff, and maybe you have had it because you found out it wasn't worth anything to start with. It was more a headache than anything else. But we all want that. God wants to bless us, so we're blessed. But he wants something else for us. He wants to adopt me. He wants to adopt you into his kingdom. He wants me to be one of his special children. Since all creation is his children, Special children are those who are able to recognize he exists, recognize what he's about through knowing and believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, his only son. That's a special relationship. Romans 8, 15 says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And we saw this morning in the same text that that allows us to cry, Abba, Father, in an intimate relationship. But first, he has to cleanse me of all the stain that sin has brought into my life. Because one thing we know about God is he is sinless. He can't tolerate sin. He won't tolerate sin. He went to the trouble of bringing his son to earth and letting him live as we live and then die on a cruel Roman cross and shed every ounce of his blood to cleanse the earth of all sin for those who will believe that that's what God was doing. He did that on Calvary's cross. And I recognized that when I was 10 years old. So that's when I was saved. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. So armed with just a 10-year-old's knowledge of God and sin and Jesus, 10 years old, I threw myself on his mercy and sought his salvation. And at that moment, at the age of 10, he made me his adopted son. In the same way, when you did the same thing, whenever you did it, at whatever age, you became one of his adopted children. I have done nothing in my life before or after that that qualifies me for sonship. Did you hear that? I'm only 10. All my right living is but a pile of filthy rags before his majesty and glory. God gave me the faith to recognize that I needed a savior and that Jesus was it. God gave me that ability. I didn't generate it on my own. And the Bible says that was enough for me to be saved, to become his son by adoption. This truth has become my life's foundation and hope and everything I do and believe and the choices I make grow out of that commitment and relationship. And now that this is accomplished, what does he want from me? Here we go all the way back to the beginning of the sermon. 
He wants me to live in such a way, with such obedience to him that others might know him and that the darkness in their lives and souls will flee, that the light of his son might abide. Person by person with whom I have contact, just living my daily life should be seeing in me little sparkles of Jesus that draw them to him. Not because I'm a professional cleric, but because I, like you, are one of his children. And that's how he has chosen to reveal himself through the church. The church, the people of God that believe him, that know him, that live according to his word, that shine in a darkened world. So I must try with his power to live as Jesus lived. Jesus embodied Micah's declaration about what the the Lord wants from you, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. These are the Ten Commandments reduced to three. If you don't believe me, check it out. Simplified, if you will. I like that part. Then Jesus reduced Micah's three to just two. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandments greater than these. That's two. So here it is as simple as I can make it. God is creator and there's nothing or no one like him. In order to complete his purpose, he's been revealing himself in his creation and in his action and what he wants from me is to be like his son. So if you have a question about what God's will is for your life and you've got a particular thing in mind, ask yourself, will this make me more like his son? Now that's why I go to church. That's kind of a complicated answer, isn't it? But it's simple, but I explained it. I go to church to join with others to whom he has revealed himself. To walk alongside of them. To cry with them. Worship with them. Celebrate with them. Learn from them. Share with each other all that God is doing in our lives. That we might be more like Jesus. You see, I have to. I need to. And it's a joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sometimes things can get too complicated. And as human beings, we like to delve in the complex. We love mysteries. We love to mystify people with our words. We love to do all kinds of crazy things, Lord, but you know who we are. We're your children. Father, when it all boils down, you want us to recognize who you are, for who you are. And you showed us who you are through Jesus. And Father, we have flung ourselves upon your mercy in trust of him. And Lord, we come to church so we can learn more about what it's like to be Jesus and to be more like him. To seek forgiveness when we fail and have others help us stand up again. Father, to look at a darkened world and yet see light and the opportunity for others to see that same light. Even, Father, through us and our reflection of Jesus. It's all quite simple, this gospel. Father, it's so simple that we humans want to make it super complex so that people will think we know what we're talking about. But it's not that hard. And I thank you that you made the wise to not understand while the simplest child can get it. Lord, I'm one of your children, or so are these. We get it. And we thank you that you have blessed us with faith in Jesus.
and given us eternal life. Help us, Father, to live in such a way that others will find eternal life through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Set time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and uh, Brother Stevie, if you'll dismiss us.